you look at us go. All right. Well, happy Tuesday, everyone. It is the Tuesday after a long weekend. Um, hope you're doing well. We have a beautiful day here in Amiskwichi, Eskigen and Edmonton Treaty 6 territory. Beautiful fall day. Love, love the fall colors. I love the season change. Um, I hope you're well wherever you are. Uh, I think it's always, always a good thing to always give a shout out to Crater for the gift of this beautiful day that has been given to us. Um, I hope on your long weekend that you had a chance to recuperate, spend time with family, remember all of those good things that you should be thankful for, always walking in that good space of gratitude. So we just give thanks to Creator for the gift of this moment, this virtual community that we have here at CanDo, our links to learning session. Maybe you're joining us live or maybe you're catching this on the replay and we hope and we are honored that you are here. And we hope that you walk away with, you know, some good teaching, some inspiration and new knowledge. So it's new knowledge to me. So our conversation today is Alberta's forest industry. Our guest speaker is Emma Keneal. She's joining us from Edmonton. I always love to meet new friends. So we're so honored that you've carved out a piece of your time to be with us here and teach us all about this forest in industry that I really don't know a lot about. So I really look forward to the knowledge that you're going to share about this um, today. So I love, love, love the name of this workshop is Forestry is a career with many branches. So I love it. We look forward to having you here. So you are joining, I think I've already said this, can do links to learning. We're here every Tuesday. Um, also, you can join us on Wednesdays as well with BC Innovate. We'd love to see you there. There's some good knowledge that's being shared on Wednesdays as well. So let's go on, get on with the show with our guest speaker. Um, so many Albertans tend to think of lumberjacks when they consider jobs in the forest industry, when really this isn't even a job. There are countless careers in the forest industry. Some of you may be very familiar with like electricians, accountants, and chemists. And some jobs may, may be less familiar like scalers, GIS analysts, and Sylvie culture foresters, which I could hardly say that name. But I'm sure Emma will like clue us in. Together today, we will explore the opportunities available in Alberta's forest industry with our lovely guest speaker, Emma. She's worked with Work Wild program for four years. So I bet you have like a lot of knowledge you're going to share with us and some stories. Um, growing up, Emma did not know about much about the forest industry. While she loved the outdoors and wanted a job in the environmental sector, her education in an urban high school never exposed her to the opportunities within forestry. So it wasn't until she spoke with a work wild represent a representative at a networking event that forestry became a clear choice for her career, which is awesome. So while studying at the University of Alberta in the forestry program, her passion for the industry was solidified as she took every opportunity to teach and expose fellow students and the public about both the industry and the vast career opportunities available, which is why she is here today. So it's a perfect match when her career led her to working with the Work Wild program which had helped her guide her career path when she was a student herself. So we're so excited to have, I'm so excited to have you here, Emma. And so we're just going to pass this virtual mic over to you. There will be opportunity if anyone has any questions after our comments or even their own stories to share, there will be time afterwards. So feel free to lend your voice to this conversation. So welcome, Emma. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here with you guys talking about our forest industry. Like you said, a little bit in that I didn't really know much about the forest industry before I was even working in it. And I do think in my job now, when I go out to schools or to different events and talk to people about forestry, they do have that one image of foresters sort of in their mind. We all think about plaid. We think about axes, chainsaws, the lumberjacks going off into the forest. 
but that isn't necessarily what these jobs in the industry look like. There are countless opportunities that are available in our industry that we're going to go through, whether you're somebody who's interested in a job that does get them outside every single day doing things like hiking and riding quads as a part of your job, there are opportunities available. Or if you're somebody who's more interested in technology and really likes working with computer systems, maybe flying drones or working with complex mathematical statistical formulas, there are so many different types of jobs that we're going to go through and talk about today. Certainly, if there are any questions from anyone watching live right now, feel free to either interrupt me, ask me right away, type any questions into the chat, anything like that. I'm happy to have a conversation now or afterwards as well when the presentation is wrapped up. Just as a little bit of an introduction, though, before we get into the sort of meat of the presentation here and talking about jobs that are available, I like to start off with this little video here, because I think for anyone who maybe isn't as familiar with the forest industry, maybe if you haven't gotten the chance to maybe get out to one of these sites before, see these jobs in action, I think this can give you a good idea of what our industry looks like on a day to day basis, and what the jobs actually are that we're going to talk about. So we'll start off with this little video here. It's not like the old days, back when your dad would comb his mustache, pack a bologna sandwich, and head off to a job he never really liked. The same thing day in and day out for 40 years. You have options. Today, you can work wild. Welcome to the modern world of forestry. Out here, your commute looks a little different. Your desk is wherever you want it to be. When you work wild, you could spend your days playing with technology, extracting chemicals from fiber, or virtually mapping forests. You could be operating equipment that's larger than life, or helping deliver products around the world. Your coworkers could have dorsal fins. You could be deep in the forest, or in the middle of a city. That's life in a forest company, and there are plenty of interesting jobs waiting for you. But working in forestry isn't just another job. It gives you the chance to say you're making a difference and mean it. Forests are a renewable resource that help reduce the impacts of climate change. Even if you're not working in the forest, you're still helping grow a greener future. It's not just about cutting down trees. You're keeping forests, animals, and people healthy. How's that for doing your part? Another great part of working in forestry when the job's over, the fun is in your backyard. In forestry, you're surrounded by people who love the outdoors. You'll also balance work and play better than anybody. So if you're a tradesperson, an accountant, a planter, if you're into cutting edge technology, or just plain cutting, it sounds like you're ready to work wild. Come on, what are you waiting for? Right, so I hope that was a good little view of what some of these jobs look like that we're going to go through and talk about today. Before we get into the jobs in particular, I just want to start off talking a little bit about our forest industry itself. And this is going to be maybe a little bit more Alberta specific. I know we have some people joining from other parts of Canada as well. But for forestry here in Alberta, this is a large, large industry that we have currently. And part of that is because we have so much forest. Uh, for 60% of our province in Alberta is actually covered in forested area. So pretty large area that's more than half of our province. And I have a map up on the screen here that kind of gives you a bit of a visual of what these areas look like. If you remember maybe far back into your um, banks of memories of your science classes talking about the natural regions of Alberta, that's what I have laid out on this map here. And there are three of these regions that are covered in forested areas. We have our boreal forest, of course, right in the name of that region is covered in forest up in our northern areas our Rocky Mountains as well. And then this region in between kind of sandwiched in between those are our foothills. So all three of those regions are covered in forests. And of course, having that large resource does lend us to having a fairly large industry that gets attached to that. So 
again, not a lot of people in Alberta may be super familiar with the forest industry, but it is actually our third largest resource industry that we have in Alberta. So most people probably are familiar with the fact that oil and gas is our number one most largest resource industry. Right behind that is our agriculture. And then right behind that is forestry. So it is very, very prominent and there are many opportunities within the province itself in this industry. And of course, I think most of us are probably pretty familiar with some of the different wood products that we make out of our trees in Alberta, but I like to go through a few of them just for fun, for some memory of some, and I think some of them are also a little bit less familiar to people as well. Starting off with this first one we have here, I also have a few little samples that hopefully you guys can still see my camera that I'm going to hold up for everybody to see here. So our first one in the pictures, that top left photo, and I have a little cutout of one of them here are of course our boards of lumber. I think most of us are pretty familiar with what lumber looks like, especially if you're doing any building projects or things like that. When you hear people talk about two by fours, all the different types of dimensions, or if you drive by houses being built, we tend to see lots of those boards of lumber being used. And again, even if we don't think about our usage of lumber every single day, we are using it. It's the most common thing that we are making out of our trees. There are many, many mills that make this lumber product. However, the second most common wood product I think is quite a bit less familiar to everybody. And that is in this sort of top center photo here. Looks a little bit strange in the picture, but again, I'm gonna hold up a little sample to my camera that hopefully you guys will be able to see. So this is a white kind of fluffy, almost powder like material, which you might be familiar with once I say its name. This is our wood pulp. So if you've ever heard about wood pulp before or people talk about pulp mills, this is actually the material that they are talking about. Basically our wood pulp is if you can imagine breaking down a wood fiber to its smallest little component, Basically what makes up a wood fiber is something called lignin and something called cellulose. So to make wood pulp, we actually split that fiber, we get rid of the lignin and we leave behind the cellulose. So that's another word for our wood pulp as well too. So again, even if you're not super familiar with wood pulp, we do use it every single day in our lives. Typically most people are using wood pulp as paper because that is what our wood pulp is actually used to make. So anytime you're using tissue paper, paper towels at home, reading books, writing notes, anything like that, that is where our paper is actually coming from. Then of course we either have some more building products, things like that. We have our boards of OSB lumber, which are made out of wood chips things like laminated veneer lumber, which is a little bit more technical. It does get used in home building as well. It is basically similar to our boards of lumber, but as you can kind of see in this photo here, we actually take small strips of the tree and actually stack them and glue them together, which ends up being a even stronger board than just the lumber on its own. And of course, we also want to make sure that we are utilizing some products that used to be waste in the production of things like lumber and building products. Things like sawdust and other wood chips can now be used as biofuels. So you may have seen some homes using wood pellets, like you can see in this photo here, to actually power stoves in their homes. Or maybe if anybody's a big uh, cooker, if you use a smoker, you might see pellets used in smokers now, or animals typically can use this, um, what used to be waste from our processes in bedding. So of course we wanna make sure we're using like, every single part of that tree. So these are some of the wood products that I think people are fairly familiar with, you may have heard of, but I also think a lot of people can be pretty shocked just to find out how many ways in their daily lives they are using wood products. Because we talked about, you know, your homes having wood products, paper products you might be using, but there are many, many other things that you are using every single day. So while everything on the last screen was wood products, Everything on the screen now are also wood products. All of these things actually have different types of wood products added into them in their manufacturing process. 
Many of them use that same wood pulp that we just talked about that was in this bag here. So believe it or not, you actually do eat a lot of wood pulp every single day because it is added into food products now. So things like Parmesan cheese that I have on the screen, there's lots of other food products that use it too, different types of salad dressings. Oreo cookies is one that has wood pulp in it. Sometimes ice cream products have wood pulp added into it now. There are many, many different things that have it. Typically, it's not necessarily added to food because it gives it great flavor. You might not eat an Oreo cookie and think, oh, it really tastes like trees when you're eating the Oreo cookies. But it actually gets added in to help somehow with um, the food more so on a chemical level. So for things like Oreo cookies, that wood pulp actually typically gets added into the icing of the cookie to actually act as a thickener. And it gives it that almost sort of paste-like consistency. There's lots of other things that use this pulp in a chemical form. That's also why there's nail polish and even pens on the screen there because in different types of inks and paints, we'll actually use a certain type of this wood pulp in a chemical form because our chemical engineers have actually found that when it gets added into these paints, it speeds up the drying time. So sometimes even in certain types of varnishes or paint you may also use on your walls in your homes could have this wood pulp in this sort of chemical state added in as well. And then last kind of really cool thing that typically can have our wood pulp as well. You might be seeing this bottle of water and thinking, how is the water that I drink suddenly having wood products in it? But that photo is actually there because of the bottle. Because again, our chemical engineers, when they were studying different ways to use wood pulp, they actually found a way to turn wood pulp into plastic. So the plastic water bottles now can actually be made out of our trees and out of our wood products. You might see with some different types of um, products, you might see things like um, different labels that say things like plant bottles or uh, biodegradable plastic, plant plastic, any of those kind of terms that you could possibly see on your plastic typically means it was made out of some type of plant material like our trees. So it is becoming much more common. So pretty interesting when you actually get into it and see all of these different ways that our wood products are actually being used in our daily lives, which is pretty cool. Now, of course, we know lots about our wood products, but we're here to talk about some different types of career opportunities. So I do want to go through and talk about them. Like I said at the start, there are so many different types of careers. So we're not just going to talk about one possible career path. We'll talk about quite a few and kind of break them into a few sections. You kind of see some of the sections up on the screen there that we're going to go into. But there is actually one really important thing. I think it's one of the most important things to know about forestry jobs that I do have on the screen there that right now there are 40,000 people who are currently employed in Alberta within the forest industry. But believe it or not, with that many people who are currently employed, our industry in Alberta is actually experiencing something that we call a labor deficit. So even with all those people employed, basically we still have too many jobs available and not enough people actually entering into our workforce to help fill up those positions. So especially right now, there are so many different, so many opportunities available for people if you're interested in joining into this industry. And it's also not a um, opportunity that's going to disappear anytime soon. Because if you actually look at the sort of statistics of the forest industry as a whole, right now it's predicted that in just 50 years, we're actually likely going to be, or sorry, I said 50 years, and likely in 10 years, we're going to be losing 50% of our workforce to retirement. So a huge number of people will soon be leaving our industry and we don't have nearly the amount of people to actually joining in to fill up those positions. So again, there will be so much opportunity 
I know it's kind of hard to hear some of those stats and really put it in per perspective of what those industries look like. So I often like to kind of describe it in a bit more detail by telling my personal story of when I started working in forestry, because I think it helps put it into a bit more of perspective. Um, so like we said in the introduction, my job in forestry was um, becoming a forester. So I had to go through the University of Alberta's forestry program to get that job. It was a four year Bachelor of Science degree program. And when I was in school, my graduation class in that program had 12 people in it. And if at any point, if you have looked into or have gone through university programs in yourself, you probably know that that is a very, very small number of people to be in a university class, right? Usually you're in lecture halls with hundreds and hundreds of people, lots of students all together. So we had a very, very small program. But that year when me and those other 12 people actually graduated and were starting out in the industry, that year in Alberta, the amount of entry level forester positions that were posted, there were over 100 jobs available that year. And the program that we were coming out of is actually the only university level forestry program in the province. So we weren't competing with lots of other classes, other students. There were basically just 12 people entering the workforce trying to fill over 100 jobs. So everyone I knew coming out of school, we all had our choice of what kind of jobs we wanted. We had great paying jobs right at the start. We didn't have to do lots of internships and things like that. That might not always be the most fun jobs for people to do. We had really great jobs right off the start and in the areas that we were interested. So that really is a look at what all of the jobs we're gonna talk about today look like in terms of opportunity. There is just so much out there. So that's why I say, if there's one thing you take away from the presentation today, do know that our industry is really looking for more people to enter in. But now that we've gone through that opportunity, we'll go through and talk about some of the jobs in a little bit more detail so you guys know what is actually out there. So first few jobs we're going to talk about are kind of the more outdoors, maybe more environmental science type jobs. So if you are somebody who has an interest or a background in science, these are jobs that would be open to you. If you're also just somebody who would be interested in getting into these jobs, if you have a love of being outside, you're kind of interested in maybe a little bit more of an analytical job, this would be a great opportunity for you. There are some pretty big perks of these jobs. These things are what actually got me to go into forestry, that you have the opportunity to be paid to go hiking every single day, be out on a quad, out in the forest every single day, rain or shine. So there are some setbacks potentially if you're not so much of wanting to be outside every single day, maybe there are um, some parts of the job that you wouldn't like as much, but they are great opportunities. I think in general, probably most people are kind of familiar with what a typical sort of biologist or a typical kind of scientist might do in forestry. They are typically conducting research based on their expertise. We do have many biologists working out in the forest, whether they're studying the plants, the animals themselves, the soil in the forest, or even getting into a little bit more technical sciences like our entomologists and pathologists that I also have on the screen there. So there are certain type of biologists who are actually studying all of the bugs and insects and the diseases of our forest as well too. Kind of an easy way to remember them is they're like the tree doctors. They're looking at things that could be affecting our tree's health and coming up with strategies to help manage um, those different potential infestations. And I always tend to talk about our entomologists and our pathologists in these presentations because it is a job that's highly in demand, a bit unfortunately for us living here in Alberta, because we do have some pretty big issues with some certain types of insects. So especially if you have been maybe listening closely to the news or some of the research out in the forest or even been out to certain areas, especially in and around um, Jasper in Alberta right now, you may have noticed that some of our pine trees have been affected by a certain type of beetle called the mountain pine beetle. So this beetle is very small in size. It's only about the size of a grain of rice but it does cause some very large issues 
in our forest because when it burrows into mature pine trees, it actually brings a certain type of fungus inside of the tree that will basically spread through the tree kind of like a disease. And this fungus ends up stopping the spread of food and water from moving up and down a tree's trunk. So unfortunately, if the fungus does continue to spread, it can kill our trees. And right now we have high, high populations of these beetles, higher than we have ever had before, which is one of the reasons that you do hear so much about them. And again, I do have some samples here that I'm gonna hold up to my camera that hopefully you guys will be able to see here. But in this little vial that I have, I actually have some of the mountain pine beetles. So they might be hard to see. They probably just kind of look like little black dots because they are so tiny. But these are what the beetles look like in real life. So they're very, very, very small. And what they do is they do fly through our forest. They can usually move about five kilometers in a single day. And they will find old mature pine trees. They burrow into them. Again, I have a little sample here. This is just a piece of bark that is from a pine tree. And you might notice that right here, there's this kind of little yellow spot on the bark. And this is actually something that we call a pitch tube, which is basically the spot where the beetle burrowed into this tree. And as part of the tree's natural defenses, it would actually have pushed out a lot of sap from the hole in the tree to try and push the beetle outside of its trunk. Unfortunately, this tree was unsuccessful because if you flip it around, you can also see that there are lots of little tunnels all throughout the inside of the bark there. Something that again, our entomologists, they would call these beetle galleries, where the beetle would move all the way through the tree. It would eat away some of its material to actually fuel the beetle itself. And also it will create um, little um, areas within the tree where it will lay eggs as well inside of the tree and have younger beetles also be living inside of the tree. So there are some pretty, pretty big problems that these scientists do have to research within our forest. So they will typically spend some time outside collecting their data, conducting their research, and also some time in a lab as well, kind of crunching all of those numbers and putting that information into more digestible um, reports that we can then use to help fuel our management of the forest and taking all of that information in and making a plan to go forward is what this job that I have in the center of the screen here would be doing. So our foresters or our forest technicians, they take in all that information and they will write and execute something called forest management plans. And it is a pretty big job in Alberta because these plans, they actually have to look 200 years into the future when they are writing those plans. So at any point in Alberta for any area that our forestry companies are managing, they have a plan of what's going to be happening for 200 years into the future. And that's what our foresters are doing. So they take in all that information. They plan when and where they may harvest trees to make those products we talked about. And they are also responsible for regrowing the forest after any harvesting happens, which is quite a big job. And that's in particular what those silviculture foresters would do that we talked about in the intro of our presentation. They have to make sure all of that regrowth happens. So our foresters, they tend to be outside maybe a little bit more than the scientists. They have to really be experts in their sort of area of the forest that they'll be working. But it is very important to make sure that that work is being done. And if you are interested in being a forester in the province, it's a little bit more of a specific way you have to go about getting that job because it is actually a registered profession in our province. So it's similar to things like um, engineers or even teachers where you have to register with a official college. So because of that, you also have to go through some specific training. Uh, so like I mentioned, there are some programs available in Alberta. One of them is at the University of Alberta. So you could take a four-year Bachelor of Science program. That was the program 
I went through myself. The other option is also available at Nate in um, Edmonton as well. They have a two year forest technology program available. So it is a little bit shorter than the U of A program. It's also much more hands on, which can be really great for people if you maybe don't love the idea of sitting in those big lecture halls like we talked about, if you would rather learn about the forest by being out there in the forest, getting a hands on view of what is happening. That Nate program is a wonderful option for that because you can actually get that hands on experience. So to kind of close off this section here of jobs we've talked about, I want to show you guys another video. So this video is going to talk a little bit in particular about the Nate Forestry Technology Program we just mentioned, but it does also sort of talk about forestry as a job as a whole as well too. And some of the things they mentioned would apply for working as a scientist in the industry or even taking um, those U of A courses as well too. I got into forestry because I really enjoyed being outdoors and hiking a lot and just spending my time being in the bush and I figured forestry was a good option for that. Here we'll be doing our pre-harvest assessments to see if the site needs any site preparation, so mechanical or it can be just left as natural. So we dig these soil pits to check out the soil condition, looking for the moisture, if there's any rutting and compaction, if it's wet and cold it might need to be elevated or if there's too much organic material on top, it might need to be mixed in or just scraped away. There's lots of soil characteristics to tell us if it's a okay site to harvest on. We also check out the species that's on the site before we harvest to see um, what the best species will be to plant and to make sure it regenerates into a normal forest again. Success would be getting the forest back to a ecological similar forest to the surrounding and what was there before. We're doing performance surveys for regeneration. It's a commitment to grow back what you harvest, so this is our quality check to make sure everything's growing as it should be. We're kind of the, the after stage after the harvest and kind of assuring that we can bring the forest back to what it was so that ultimately we can harvest again, but more importantly to restore biodiversity and make sure the ecology of the forest area is maintained. Government makes sure that the industry is doing as they should be, so that they do audits and checks to make sure that What's being reforested is actually up to the Alberta reforestation standards. Silviculture checks like this make sure that everything is going as it should be. Through our brush soil lab we learned a lot of things. It, we learned about managing a crew and actually what you're looking for in terms of quality of brush soil work and what not to do really. The benefits of brush saw, it helps with vegetation competition, it opens up the area and it allows the dominant tree species to gain more of a girth and diameter as it opens up that area. Uh, with decreasing the population of the veg competition, it allows new trees to be introduced into the landscape. This also helps with wildlife. I just enjoy being able to get out to the field and actually do the hands-on material instead of just being in a classroom all the time. I've always been into uh, hiking and the outdoors, so I really researched between a few uh, institutes and I found that Nate was quite hands-on, so I wanted to take advantage of that. There's surprisingly a lot of amount of girls in the program, so that was a big surprise for me as well. And in my second year now, it's just uh, elaborating and getting more experience in the field and in different areas, uh, really opening me up to how many uh, jobs there actually are in the field and there's so many different places I could go. I would definitely recommend this program to people who love being outdoors and really like hands-on work. Uh, they have to be a really good team worker, so if that's for you, I definitely say pursue the forestry industry, especially at night. So hopefully that gave you guys a good view of what that Nate program and some of those jobs in the sort of environmental side do look like. But we will sort of switch gears now and go into talking about some of the more production-based jobs within our industry. So starting off, we'll talk about 
our equipment operators and our transportation drivers. So something interesting about these jobs is it's actually what we find right now are the top two most highly in demand jobs within our industry. There's huge demand and huge opportunity for people to enter into these jobs. So much so that it's actually quite a bit easier to get into these jobs now than it has ever been before as well. And other years, if you maybe wanted to start operating equipment in the forest industry, you'd oftentimes, before you could get started, need to have lots of licenses, lots of experience on different types of machines before companies would hire you. But right now we can actually find that quite a few companies will actually hire into these positions for people who just have their basic driver's license and their high school diploma. That's all you need to get started. Of course, you do still often need lots of licenses and things like that and training before you actually start out on the equipment. But instead of you having to go out and get all of that training and licensing done, companies will now actually pay you to go out and take all of that training. So before where some of these programs would cost you thousands of dollars out of pocket before you start work, you can now have a company cover all of those costs and get started right away. So these are some really great jobs. They're also very well paying in our province. Typically, if you were to start off in these jobs in your first few years, you would still be expected to make anywhere from about 60 to $65,000 a year. And with more experience in the industry, training on different types of equipment, that salary is likely to raise throughout your career working on this type of equipment. So it is a great opportunity I also often hear that one of the biggest things that people maybe are more hesitant about thinking that this might might be the job for them is I'll hear people say things like, well, I've never seen forestry equipment. I don't know how it works. Maybe I've never operated equipment before and they assume that that means the job is not for them. But I will tell you that that's not true. You could actually have lots of the skills you need to operate these pieces of equipment, even if you have never stepped foot in one of the machines in your life. There's actually a question that a lot of people use in interviews and things like that to kind of gauge how good of an equipment operator somebody might be. And that question is if you play video games. Something that seems completely different from a career as an equipment operator, but if you play video games, you actually already have many of the skills that you need to operate these pieces of equipment. Sounds a little weird, but it does make sense if you think about it, right? You need to have good hand-eye coordination, fast reflexes. We need people who can operate large control panels of their machines quickly, efficiently. You also, I'm guessing if you're playing games quite a bit, when you're holding a controller, playing your video games, you're probably not staring at it, trying to figure out where all the buttons are. You can operate those controls while looking at a screen which is similar to what our operators have to do. They need to operate their control panel while looking out the window of a machine. We wanna make sure that if you're leaning over to try to find a button, you're not looking away and crashing into a tree. You have to be able to operate all those controls quickly, which is something that if you're playing video games, you likely have those skills, which is pretty cool. But again, even if you haven't ever seen forestry equipment before, that again, doesn't discount you from these jobs. And I do have another video here that I'm going to play that will show you what our equipment in Alberta does look like. Now, as this video is playing, I'm gonna turn the sound down just a little bit here on this one, because I'm gonna kind of talk through this video and kind of explain in a bit more detail what these machines are and what it is that they're doing. But the types of machines that we're going to see in this video are what you would see if you went out to any harvesting site in our province. The first machine you can see working here is something called a feller buncher. So it's actually our piece of equipment that does the active cutting or harvesting of our trees. A lot of people when they see feller bunchers maybe out in the woods, they see those big kind of mechanical arms on the machine and they think that they grab onto the tree and just pull it out of the ground from its roots. That actually isn't what happens. You'll be able to see in a few shots here, a bit more close up, but at the bottom of the machine, there is actually a big spinning saw blade. So as the operators extend the arms towards the tree, 
that saw blade at the bottom, it helps the tree completely level with the ground. So we're not wasting any of the tree. They're not huge stumps that are left out in the forest. The arms of the tree will grab onto the trunk, lift up the entire tree, then move it away from the surrounding forest and lay those trees down into piles. And they make sure that they can do that so that they can be super selective about which trees they harvest and which ones they leave behind. They always have to leave trees behind when they harvest in Alberta. And that's actually a huge part of the training that these operators go through. It's not just how to safely and efficiently manage these machines. They also have to learn a lot about the environment before they're allowed to actually go out um, and start their jobs as well too. The next machine that you guys just saw drive up from the bottom of the screen there is something called a spitter. So it's the machine that actually collects the trees from the forest and brings them to the side of the road. They kind of look like really big tractors, but they have that arm on the back that will grab onto the trees and pull them through the forest. And then last step, before we actually pick up all those trees and bring them off to a mill to make them into those different products we talked about, the first thing that actually has to happen is happening from that green machine there. So that's something called a bee limmer or a processor. So it's picking up every single tree individually, moving it through. And then you'll see when it got to the top of the tree, it pushes off all of those branches, the needles, the leaves of the tree. And then it'll cut the tree into smaller logs. But again, of course, we don't want to have any waste after we harvest our trees. We want to make sure every single part gets used. So those branches, even though we may not typically make wood products out of them in Alberta, we do want to use them in some way. So oftentimes those foresters that we talked about who have to regrow the forest after this harvesting happens, they will actually come back and sometimes collect those branches and spread them back out into the forest so that they leave a good layer in the forest to decompose, leave good nutrients in the soil, for the young trees that are going to grow in those areas. There are even some of our mills now that have some really cool technology um, available that's called cogeneration. So that will actually allow them to collect the branches, take them to a mill, but instead of turning them into products, they can actually use this technology to turn tree branches into electricity. And it actually powers all of the functions of their mills so they don't have to take energy from our electric grid. Sometimes they'll actually make more electricity than they need. So it'll actually get provided to the company or to the communities that are nearby those companies. And then of course, the last step, we saw those logs being taken to one of our mills on our logging trucks. And then oftentimes our mills have those huge big cranes that can lift up a whole load of logs at once and actually move them around the mill so that they can slowly get filtered in to our, um, into our mills to be made into products. So that's sort of the typical process that we use to actually harvest our trees. But now that we kind of saw what our harvesting it looks like in our province, I often like to talk about how much we're actually harvesting because I think this number is pretty shocking to a lot of people who live in our province. But our forestry companies, each and every year in our province, we are actually only allowed to harvest less than 1% of all of our forests. It's a really specific number that gets chosen every single year. And the basis of it is to make sure that we are harvesting at a sustainable level. We don't want to be over harvesting our forest to the point where the natural regrowth can't actually keep up with how much we're taking. And we want to make sure that every single year, there are healthy growing forests for us to use for all the uses other than wood products, right? We all like to get out and recreate and enjoy our forests. So that's part of what that planning process we talked about is making sure that we have those sustainable levels. And I often like to kind of show why we pick this less than 1% number with this photo here. I know it's not a super exciting photo to look at on its own. And I'm also gonna kind of make you guys think a little bit about some math when we're looking at this photo. But so in this picture, there are 100 trees. 
So if you pretend for a second that those 100 trees represent 100% of all of our forests in the province, basically if I was allowed to go and harvest 1% of those 100 trees, basically that means each year I can take away one tree. So if you imagine I'm going through and every single year I can take away one of the trees from this picture, maybe my first year I take this tree I've circled, the next year I take the tree beside it, and so on and so forth. Each year I take away one tree. It's gonna take me a pretty long time to work my way through that whole photo, go through every single tree until I end up with my last tree here when I finally run out. And again, if we have 100 trees, I take one tree every single year, it's gonna take me 100 years until I run out of trees. But have I actually run out of trees? No, I haven't run out of trees because again, like we said, those trees are regrowing. They'll grow back naturally after harvesting and our forestry companies do also make sure that those forests are gonna be regrowing. We sometimes help the process by planting new trees as well too. So if you think about that example again, and if every single year when I harvest one of those trees, I'm also planting a new one in its place, if I do that, work my way through again 100 years until I run out of trees, if I now go back to the very first tree that I harvested and replanted, that tree that I planted is now actually 100 years old. And in Alberta, a 100 year old tree is actually considered to be at the end of its life cycle. That's when a tree typically actually becomes vulnerable to things like wildfires or some of those insects and diseases. So typically we might wanna start considering harvesting our trees when they get to that age. So that's a very, of course, simple view of what that planning looks like, but that's why we can only take a small amount just because that's all we can take while keeping that process sustainable. If you imagine that in every year, even if I take one additional tree, my math no longer works. If I finish my final tree after 100 years and I've been taking two trees every single year, I'll actually run out quite a bit faster and those trees that I planted won't be ready yet. So we have to make sure that only that specific amount can be taken. All right, so now also talking about some jobs that are sort of still in production, but a little bit different, kind of off of the harvesting side. I have two jobs here that on paper look very different, but I usually talk about them together because there are some big similarities. So working as a tree planter or a wildland firefighter, these are jobs that are both held seasonally. So these are jobs you could um, go into typically in the summer months in our province. You only work for a few months out of the year, and then you have the rest of the year off. But in both of these jobs, they are quite well paying. You do get paid in different ways, but because you work so hard for those few months out of the year, you are compensated well. And a lot of people, if you have the right sort of budgeting throughout the rest of the year, there are many people who can work in these jobs in the summer and then take the rest of the year off. They don't necessarily need to work all year round because of those summer jobs, which also gets to be a great opportunity if anyone's thinking about wanting to um, go into certain post-secondary or college programs. A lot of people will do these jobs in the summer when you're off of school and the money that you make can pay for all of your tuition and living costs throughout the year. So there's some great opportunities there. Although both of these jobs are a little bit more physically demanding, uh, working as a wildland firefighter, of course, you do have to put in some physical work fighting the wildfires. There's all different types of crews that you could be a part of. And of course, our tree planting is also physical work. because Every tree in Alberta does get planted by hand by these people who are working in the summer. And they do work very, very quickly. Typically, a tree planter can plant anywhere from two to 5,000 trees in one day. Just one person can plant that many. So it is very physical work. But again, like we said, these are very great jobs, very well-paying jobs, especially our tree planters. They do get paid in a bit of a strange way when you're out working as a tree planter. You don't necessarily make a um, amount of money per hour or per day. You actually get paid per tree that you plant. 
So if you can plant many, many trees in a day, you can end up making quite a bit of money. Usually a tree planter could make anywhere from about 10 to maybe 25 cents per tree that they're planting. So it doesn't typically sound like a lot of money on its own, but if you think about it in terms of planting two to 5,000 trees a day, you end up making some pretty good money. So really great jobs to consider if you're looking for something that is a seasonal opportunity. Of course, some other great opportunities that our industry have are work within the skilled trades. Our sort of jobs in the skilled trades are what we find are the second most highly in demand jobs just after those equipment operation jobs. There are many different types of skilled trades that are employed in forestry. These are just a few of the sort of more common ones you may see being hired right now. Of course, if you do want to get into these jobs, again, you do have to go through a bit more of a formal training process, um, especially in Alberta, you do have to go through um, an apprenticeship program and finish with a red seal before you can work as a certified journey person in these trades. But again, because there is so much demand, companies are very willing to bring on new people, get you started in an apprenticeship. Lots of companies even will have different types of benefits and perks for you to go and actually get the different types of education you need along with your apprenticeship program. If you're not living in Edmonton or Calgary to go to Nate or Sage, lots of companies will actually pay you to go off and take your training uh, programs um, and will help cover living costs and things like that for your stay while you're getting those different types of trainings. There's a lot of help for companies to get you into these skilled trades positions as well. Okay, so this is actually the last job that I have to talk about here. And this is an awesome job for students. So if there's anybody on the call right now or who might be watching the replay later, if you or somebody you know is a student in Alberta who is 16 to 18 years old, this is a summer job opportunity that is available. It's a really, really great program that is hosted by the government. It's called the Alberta Junior Forest Rangers. And again, I'm going to play this video and kind of explain the job in a bit more detail while you guys are watching it here. So it is a summer job for high school students. Basically how the job is um, set up is when our students apply, they take an interview, and if they are selected to work in this program, Basically, they get to spend the summer living and working out of a camp somewhere across the province. There are multiple camps all across Alberta that students could be working out of. While they're at camp for the summer, they are working with a crew of people who are all their same age who have come from other places across the province. They get to spend a lot of time outside. So again, if you are or know somebody who wants a summer job that still gets them outside every single day, this is an awesome opportunity. And instead of having a summer job where you might end up doing the same thing every single day, this program is set up very different. Basically like a trial run of all these different types of forestry jobs we've talked about today. Students will kind of spend their summer basically starting the week off in one job. They'll spend a full week getting immersed into what the job is like, working side by side with people in that job. And then the next week they'll try something new. And they'll do that for the whole summer, just rotating through jobs, trying new things. You see in the video some of the different types of experiences students will get. Oftentimes they get to work with our wildland firefighters. They might get to work with some scientists, like you'll see here, um, some biologists who are doing research on some different types of owls. Oftentimes, they'll also get to try their hand at tree planting, see how many trees they can possibly plant in a day. There are all different types of really great experiences that they will be exposed to in this job. So again, it is open to anyone who is 16 to 18 years old. There's some information that's going to come up on the screen here in a second of where students can apply. So this is a paid job, but I will say that the wage that came up on the screen here is quite outdated. 
So they're not only making $11.50 an hour, you can find more up-to-date wages and everything on the Alberta JFR website there. There is also the opportunity for students to receive high school credits throughout this job as well too, to help them graduate. So really all around, it is a great opportunity for students to try some new jobs. If they are interested in working in forestry later on, it's a great way to build up their resume as a student. You'll also just meet lots of great people who are like-minded and get some great experiences throughout the summer. So if you do have anyone who might be interested, the website was up on the screen there. It's albertajfr.ca where students can find out how to apply. The applications do come out quite early in the year. Um, so it's definitely something you want to think about early on. Typically the applications will be out in the winter time for the summer. So keep that in mind early on if you're interested. All right, so I know we've gone through many, many jobs, but this is the end of my presentation here. I hope everyone was able to learn a little bit more about forestry. If you are interested in any of the jobs we talked about, I have my program's website up on the screen here now. It's workwild.ca. If you go there, you can find out information about every single type of job we talked about today, things like the salary of those jobs, the types of education or training you would need to get into them, what um, different types of jobs are like, hearing from people within them. We have lots of interviews on our website. There is also an active job posting board as well too. So we will compile opportunities from forestry companies all across the province. So if you do want to take a look at any um, current postings that are available, you can also see that. And again, if there are any students watching as well, we also have a page filled with scholarships. So definitely take a look of those. There are scholarships. If you're interested in going into any types of sciences, if you're going into college, university, even if you are specifically looking at taking any types of training programs or starting an apprenticeship, there's also lots and lots of scholarship money out there. So definitely take a look at that. But thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. If anyone does have any last minute questions or anything like that, I am happy to answer any questions. Wow, thank you, Emma. So fascinating. Like you just kind of like expanded my world this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. You've covered so much ground. Even I was spent the weekend with my nephews and I thought, oh my goodness, I got to send them this way. I got to show them um the possibilities of of this industry i think this this would be up right up their alley so uh, does anyone before we go like before we move on before we say goodbye does anyone have any questions or comments before we close we'd love to hear from you i think right off the the bat you had talked about um um that this this connection of taking care of the land and also the the animals and all, and all of these resources that have been given to us as a gift to take care of and already that you know you drew me in you made that connection for me so i think that that's beautiful this is an amazing um job like you must love your job Definitely. I love my job. That is what drew me into this area in particular as well, doing work in sort of education and outreach side. I was just so in love with my job that I have to spread the message to everyone I can talk to about the amazing opportunities. Because like you mentioned, oftentimes people themselves or even people you know may be the perfect fit for this industry and they just don't know that it's out there. So it's really great to be able to, to learn more about what this industry is like. Yeah, it's great. Like, like you, like you just opened up a whole new world for me. Um, Ken says, "Great presentation, thank you." Uh, Sarah gave you a nice clap there. Uh, we're just so thankful that you were able to share what you do. It just is so exciting, and the possibility. I just really think of our young people, and this this is a great opportunity possibility for them. So, thank you so much. Okay, Sarah. Sarah has a question. Sarah, go for it. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm glad I came today, um, especially just because of like everything that's happening with uh, Ferry Creek and on the West Coast. Um, and so I guess like, I guess it's a little political, my question. Um, I, I really like like the Feller uh, branch, uh, Buncher. 
Um, my question for that was, how is this sustainable? But I seen that later it leaves the stumps. Um, I'm really glad that you put that in there because it's like, I've tried to do some research around it. Um, one of my questions was like the 200 years into the future, um, who is regulating this and how are you guys being accountable for um, being sustainable out there? That's just a question. I guess it's probably more provincial based and it's a bit different than what's going on in BC, but I'm in Manitoba. So it, it's kind of all over the board there, but yeah. You bet. Yeah. So forestry in particular as an industry, like you said, it is very provincial. Uh, so for us here in Alberta, it is entirely regulated by the provincial government. So for us, our forestry companies um, that we're talking about in this presentation, all of the land that they would be operating off of is um, publicly owned land. So the government is basically the ones who are managing that land base for all of us. Because in Alberta, our public land, we are all landowners. So the government takes on that responsibility and they will basically allow companies to do their work on this land, but they have to follow the restrictions that are placed by the government. And then like you said as well, they have to be held accountable as well. So uh, the provincial government uh, does require auditing. They will go out to the land to make sure that certain things are done properly that um, the provincial policies are being followed. Also quite a few um, companies in Alberta, they will also seek out um, third party certifications. So they won't only be held accountable by the government, but they'll also go out and find these certifications to make sure that sometimes they're even following more stringent policy than the government even has to get these third party certifications. So you sometimes might see them on certain types of wood products. Um, you might see little certification symbols. And if you go onto their website, you can see all of the different um, kind of qualifications that companies had to meet for that, that product to be certified. Thank awesome you. Question. Awesome. I, yeah, so we did have another question, but um, in the chat box, but he or she just said you just mentioned it. So I think you answered that question there. I hope um, I'll just give it a mo moment in case you wanted to come on and just um, ask, ask or say if you if she did cover what you were asking. Did I assume? Hi, Emma. Yes, you did. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Such a fascinating topic. Thank you so much, Emma. So this was Emma from Work Wild. Um, she has the website up there, so check them out. It's um, so if you look right on that page she has, Sarah, it's right there. The website's right there. And if you do have any, if anyone has questions later on as well, if they go onto the website, there is a little contact um, website or a little page on our website that says contact. And there's a little info box. You can type in any question and send it off and we'll make sure to answer any questions that come up as well afterwards. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I hope you feel enlightened as I do. I feel really good after listening to your presentation and really hopeful for our future too. You, you were talking about a greener future and just taking care of the land and, and all of the resources. So thank you so much, uh, Emma. So thanks everyone. Hope you have a good day just as you walk along your path for during the rest of this day, may you um, just remind yourself who you are, where you come from, the land in which you live and stand on. Uh, may you walk in a good way that honors all of our relations, you know, the people, the animals, the plants, the waters, and most of all, give thanks to Creator. So take care, everyone. Peace.